fun. That was good. For those of you, I mean, we can see the timer, and as he said his last word, it actually changed to red in four minutes. Nothing more accurate. So let me just grab my talk out and hope I can read my writing. So the topic is not about healing. I'm not quite sure where that came from. But it's something that um, in my job, so for most of you who know me, I'm a GP, and in the last 12 months in particular, I've been asked more and more and more questions about parenting because people are finding it harder to work out how to actually look after their kids in the way the world now has things done. And my bio on my website at work has me as a Christian. And so a lot of my patients are Christians. The kids go to Christian schools of some sort. And quite often I can give those people a Bible answer as well as a doctor answer. And I thought what we might do today is just go through a few, I guess the way, what I actually titled it is what would Jesus' parenting style be, is, is I guess the title. And if we quickly look in John chapter 1, because if we're only able to use the things Jesus precisely said, it'd be a fairly short talk, because there are quite a few things he said about parenting. But if we read verse 1 of John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in verse 14, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the Word is Jesus. So we can actually grab, when we're looking for how we parent or what advice we might be looking for, we can grab anything out of here. So let's go to Isaiah to have a look at some words that the prophet said about Jesus. Isaiah chapter 9. I guess we'll start here at the pinnacle of what we'd all love to be able to do as parents and then come down to a fraction more reality as we move forward. So Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And I'm not sure that, I mean, I guess there's, there's a fair number of us here who are parents. And I'm not sure that we can all claim to have been wonderful parents all the time or that we've always given great advice when we've been trying to counsel our children. And as for mighty, well, my son Rowan, who's in the sound box doing the AV, as of about two years ago when he was 15, wrestle games were a really bad idea because I lost within about two or three seconds. And he had me pinned, and I'm like, ah, can we stop now? So the mightiness, yeah, it lasted for 15 years, which 15, 14, 15 is a really interesting age when we come to talking about parenting styles. But from 15 onwards, I certainly can't wrestle him. I can't control him physically, and I wouldn't actually try to. And peaceful. Well, I'm not sure all of us manage to be peaceful all the time. We try, but peace disappears every now and again. But to make us feel better about the peaceful bit, let's go to Matthew 21. Because I don't think Jesus quite managed to be peaceful all the time either. So we're going we're gonna to mirror what we expect of ourselves from how Jesus did things. Matthew chapter 21, and looking in verse 12. And Jesus went into the temple of God... And cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple, and overthrew the tables of the money changers, and the seats of them that sold doves. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I can't imagine that if you're going into a temple full of people who are selling things, and you grab their table full of money and toss it over, I don't know that that's going to be super peaceful. I think it's probably going to be a bit noisy and there's going to be some consternation and some loud words. What do you reckon? 
That's why, that's why I picture, when I, when I picture that event, I picture it being a bit noisy and a bit contentious. So when we're looking at how we do things, it's fair to not expect ourselves to always be mighty or always be peaceful or always counsel with exactly the right words. And if we go to the Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 22... And we want verse 6. And when we get to the word child here, we can use the word child or we can use the word us. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Or train up Darren in the way he should go, and when he is old, which I'm getting that way, he will not depart from it. So that counts for us as parents, that counts for us as brothers and sisters. It counts for all of us, really. Even if you're 80 today, you still can be trained. I think. We'll check with his wife later. Maybe not. But God's way, the way Jesus, I think, would parent, is for consistent and constant training. And there's two words there, consistency and constant. Train up a child in the way you'd have them go, in the way you'd have them behave, in the way you'd have them speak in their engagement and that becomes a habit and habits are a good thing for us and we compare that to the way this world's doing things let's jump to Ephesians the world doesn't like consistent sensible training anymore it seems to like having the rules change all the time and there's a new theory out all the time and a new plan and a new strategy. I think for those of you who are teachers, every few years the curriculum changes a bit and you're meant to teach something different. And that is a very interesting way to do things. So Ephesians chapter 2, and we'll start in verse 2. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature of the children of wrath, even as others. So the way this world would have us parent is to let whatever happens happen, to let people learn by their mistakes, um, to be inconsistent, to let the rules change, even, even the, the decisions of what sort of body you're in are now open for interpretation and discussion and alteration. So everything's open for a look at what we might make of it. And when I look at the scriptures, that's not the way I'd see Jesus parenting us. If he was going to parent us it's not going to be this laissez-faire parenting where there's no rules, there's no plan, there's no strategy, there's no consistency. It's going to be something there where there is a plan, there is a strategy, and also where there's consequences. That if you do this, this is what will happen next. That's, that's the, what I read about Jesus when he parents. But when I see all these patients who are bringing in, and it often is a... 13, 14, 15 year old. Unfortunately, I think 13 is the new 15. Um, and I guess for teachers, you'd probably agree with me. Parents, you may not always realise that. But 13 is the new 15, 11 is the new 13, 9 is the new 11. Everything that this world used to have happen later is now happening earlier. And let's go to 2 Corinthians and have a look at what's going on there. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. The one thing I don't like about COVID, there used to be a drink here for you to have a drink halfway through, but we don't get a drink anymore. At least we don't have a mask on at the moment, although they may be coming back. Chapter 4 and verse 4. In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So this world, 
doesn't want consistency and people knowing who they belong to and who they are and that they're actually beholden to a creator. It's not convenient to have those things as part of your parenting style anymore or as part of what you teach in school. You've got a teacher, an individual, that can make their own choices about everything and everything is open to them. That's, that's what this world will have us do. And as soon as you do that, the light of Christ is disappearing. So I can't see that as a way parent, that Jesus would parent. In verse 5, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants of Jesus Christ. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So, if you parent the way Jesus would parent, with that consistency and the consequences and the care and the drink, <laughs> thank you, then I'm sure that a lot of us have noticed, thank you, I'm sure a lot of us have noticed <laughs> <laughs> that People ask us in the school playground when we're waiting to pick up our kids. People ask us questions about how to parent. Or people are happy to have their kids come and stay at our house or be friends with our kids. And what they're seeing when they're seeing the way we parent our kids, if we're parenting our kids the way Jesus would have us parent, they're seeing the light of the gospel. They're seeing the light of Christ come through in that parenting style. And so it's something that's got a big potency to it in showing the world that there actually is a way of parenting where there are rules and people can know who they are and people can know what needs to happen and it actually is a lot simpler. So let's look, look in Hebrews chapter 12 to see, all right, how would this work then? Hebrews chapter 12, while I have a drink. It's even cold water. Hebrews chapter 12. I better read chapter 12, not chapter 13, hadn't I? It'd make a lot more sense. Verse 7. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? So I've got two sons, and while I'm got in trouble this morning, sorry Rowan, you're going to feature in this talk a few times, and he's 17, so you can expect there's a bit of back chat at times. Who else has got a 17-year-old here? No, I don't think there's any other 17-year-olds, but there's a fair bit of back chat at times, and back chat has to be stopped, doesn't it? So that's, what it ha that's the way it works. But verse 8, but if you be without chast chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. So there's an option. You can either have some guidance as to how to live your life, or you can not. And I used a slightly different word to the one you read there, because I think it's slightly politer. In verse 9, furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? So that's talking not just to parents with their children, but that's talking to all of us, that we've had parents who, good or bad at what they did, we ended up the way we ended up, and each time we take over that mantle of being the parent, hopefully we can learn to do it a little bit better. If our parents did it brilliantly, that doesn't give us much space to improve, but we can all try. But we all want to be subject to, to Jesus, the way Jesus would parent us. And in verse 10, we actually see two opposite directions here. So I'll read half of it, and then we'll read the other half. For they verily for a few days chastens us after their own pleasure. So our natural parent, for the parents in the room, are you happy when your kids actually do what you ask them to do? 
I'm putting my hand up, yes. I'm happy when my kids do what I ask them to do. It's pretty simple, isn't it? Are you happy when people comment to you how nice your children are? And you think in the back of your head, yeah, they are now. <laughs> Sorry, Rowan. I said he was going to feature a bit, didn't I? So it doesn't always work out quite as nicely as it might appear on the outside, but we're happy when our natural children do what we'd like them to do. So we could see that if we're looking at how a Jesus parent as the old style of parenting. So if you were brought up by a silent generation person or I guess the early baby boomers, then it was a lot about discipline. And it was a lot about this is how it is, this is what you will do. And if you don't, insert punishment here. And the love and the understanding and the care and the adjustment was second or third line. That was, that was parenting. And it's a response to that style of parenting that's led to the current style of parenting, which is very much everything goes. Because we didn't like that. We wanted a bit more love and care and compassion, but we didn't quite know how to pull the two together. Well, let's read the second half of this verse and see if it helps at all. So I've got to find where I stopped. But he, for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. So when we're chastised by Jesus, or, and this is the crux of the talk, if we chastise our children in the way Jesus would have us do it, with the love and the understanding being as important as the discipline and the following what I say, then we're really teaching them. Remember, right, the, first, the second scripture we went to was training up a child. And I would much rather have a bit of back chat from my child every now and again and know what he's thinking and him to feel like he could do that without me backhanding him than I would to not know what he's thinking because he knows he's going to get in trouble for what he's thinking so he doesn't tell me. You follow that? Does that make sense? So we're parenting the way Jesus would parent. We actually want that openness and that understanding and there's some things I probably wouldn't, rather wouldn't know at times, I guess. Nothing so far, I guess. But he's only 17, the other one's only 15. There's a few years to go yet before I manage to get rid of them. Maybe not. Are you ever moving out, Rowan? Maybe not. I feed him well, so maybe not. <laughs> He's going to move out tomorrow, apparently. I doubt that. <laughs> so does that make sense? So the crux of how do we parent like Jesus is if you're using discipline without love, that's old-style parenting. If we look at that, it's Old Testament versus New Testament. If you're using love without discipline... That's the world. We need both, and both have to be used. And there'll be different times that you use different things. So if I'm talking to a mum who's got a baby who's struggling to get to sleep, then it depends on the reason that that baby's not sleeping. If that baby's got reflux, again, like Rowan, who never slept, this was before Netflix, and we used to just put five DVDs in a DVD carousel machine, and sit on a fitball bouncing this child as the only way he'd sleep. You didn't sleep, but the fitball was great because if you fall asleep, you fall off it and you wake up, so you keep bouncing. <laughs> Wish there was Netflix, it would have been so much more fun. But there was no point controlled crying that child who couldn't sleep because his stomach was burning him out. If you've got a toddler and you've got a newborn and the toddler feels like they've been usurped, we go back to the story of, of Jacob, the usurper. If you've got a toddler who feels like they've been usurped, because everyone who comes to the house comes to see the stinking newborn. <laughs> Does the newborn know whether they've come to see them or not? It's really simple. Everyone, that, everyone who's coming to the house gets told they're to come and play with the toddler for five minutes first and make it about the toddler. Then they can go talk to the baby. The baby doesn't care. The toddler then feels like this person's come to see me because I know this stinking baby is taking mum's attention. There's some really simple concepts that you can pull out and make sense of. And if you look at it, again, discipline and love is the way Jesus would do it. Discipline by itself, Old Testament. Love by itself, 
the world. Pretty simple. And we go to verse 11. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. I don't like getting in trouble any more than anyone else does. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So this whole concept of righteousness, and you can actually go looking if you want to. There's a scripture, which I won't read out, in Ezekiel chapter 18, which talks about what happens if you don't follow righteousness. So it's a high stakes game, guys. We don't want to make that mistake. And we've got a few minutes left, which is good. Let's go to Malachi chapter 3. And I'll leave you with a couple of little snapshots, if you like, of words you can remember if you want to parent the way I see Jesus parenting. Anyone that's troubling to find Malachi, if you go to Matthew, go back a page, you're probably there. Chapter 3, verse 6. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. So be consistent. It's really simple. You don't want to say you're going to do something and then not do it, which is two parts of that. If you're not going to do it, don't say it. So if you're going to ground them for three months, no one's going to ground their kid for three months, so don't say it. But if you do say it, you're now stuck with it. So you have to pre-plan, how am I going to manage this situation? Mark chapter 10, I'm trying to keep you awake by keeping you flipping through your Bible. Mark chapter 10. Now, this is a story of Jesus who I suspect was doing some Jesus things. He was talking to people. He was probably healing some people. I don't know. That's, that seems to be what he did pretty much every waking moment, wasn't it? He was either talking or healing somebody. In verse 13, And they brought young children to him, that he should touch them, and his disciples rebuked those that bought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Be available. Jesus was in the middle of something, and it was probably something pretty important, and he was prepared to stop it and give a few kids a cuddle. So I think we can do the same without being too difficult. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. And verse 4. This water's good. And you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So don't pick on them. Don't set them up. So one of my children is in this room who's taller than me and bigger than me. If he is hungry... His brain does not function. There is no filter. And if you engage with that, what do you think you're going to get? So there was a fair time, I reckon probably about five years, where if you were picking him up from school, you took a muesli bar or a banana with you, and you attempted to get said muesli bar or said banana in said child before said child melted down. And you weren't always successful. Sorry, Rowan. You can get me back later. But if I did anything but that, I was the one being stupid because my brain was functional. His brain wasn't functional. So if you know that there's something going on, or last week when same said child was sitting exams, which are not his forte, he was a bit narky the night before. Can't imagine why. Or the week before that, when he was horribly behind in his homework and we were up till 2am and then up again at 6am one day to finish something that had to be in. And I was getting cross with him until it occurred to me that at age 24, 
when I was sitting in my last medical school things and I had two essays that had to be put in. They both went in a week late. I don't think I can actually get cross with him. That's, that's a bit hypocritical. If I've, if I've done seven years of university, I still can't get myself organised to finish an essay on time, which I had six months to do, by the way. It wasn't like a two-week essay. Then I really can't get cross with the year 11 who can't be organised to finish his homework on time. So you've actually got to stop and consider because you're a bit narky when you're up at 6am slotting pictures into a wood tech assignment that should have been finished. But we all do it. So don't provoke, nurture and admonish. So you can still tell them off, but not in such a way that you're not getting the response you want, but in a way that you're actually getting them understanding, okay, yes, that's how it is. Yeah, that wasn't clever. Maybe I'll try better next semester. And hey, it might even work. Don't, don't hold your breath too hard, but it might work. Let's go to Galatians chapter 6. And verse 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual will st restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So it's pretty easy to decide that you're the one who's got the hardest lot in life. I have to go to work. I get to work at 8am if I'm lucky, and I should be there before that. And I'll leave work at 6pm if I'm lucky. And if I've got to come home and help with some homework, is that okay? Is that fair? Yeah, it is. I took it on as a parent. That's part of the game. So that's what you do. But if I decide that it's not fair, then I'm just making things harder. So sometimes for us fancy pants parents, we've got to be a bit meeker about things and decide that actually, I don't know about you guys, but I can't see Jesus if he was parenting somebody. I can't see him being particularly heavy handed. I had to dig pretty hard to find an example of Jesus looking like he lost his cool when he trashed the temple. That's about the only time I could come up with where it looked like he really lost his cool. When he was being put up to be crucified, he was pretty meek. So if he can do that, then I think we can look at how do we be meek when we're doing things. In verse 2 of that, bear you one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So one in, all in is the way I look at that. And that can be extended outwards from you as a parent to you as a brother and sister or wherever you want to take it. So... They were sort of the catchphrases that I was looking at. Um, if you want a story that Jesus gave that brings in a lot of this, Luke 15, I decided not to go through all of it because it's going to take a long time. But Luke 15, the story of the prodigal son. Basically, he's got one kid who decides to grab his inheritance early, go off and party. But that kid understands when he realises he's stuffed up he understands that dad will actually look after him. And when he comes back in, dad comes running to hug him and look after him and treats him like he's still special. That's the way I see Jesus parenting, that if you make a mistake and you admit it and you come back in and go, actually, that wasn't what I should have done, then that story really encapsulates what would happen. Do you agree? Sound reasonable? And very final scripture, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Somewhere near numbers, there it is. And verse 5. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I commanded thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up. So I think 
if we're thinking about Jesus, I mean, I mentioned before when the kids were brought to Jesus that I picture Jesus as always being on the job. He was always talking to somebody or healing somebody or doing something. And this scripture tells us that if we want our children to have that sort of relationship with us and ultimately that relationship with Jesus Christ, then at home, we've always got to be talking about him. Praying, reading, whatever it is, coming to an event, even if it happens to not be convenient, or I know of one 15-year-old lad who came to the, what was it, the Winter Wonderland yesterday. Now, a Winter Wonderland, probably not first on the list of a 15-year-old's afternoons, I wouldn't have thought, but he was happy to be here. So if we're trying to parent the way Jesus would parent, then there's a series of things there. So talking about him all the time, so that we're actually making it easy on ourselves because Jesus is then with us doing some of the parenting. We're consistent, we're available, we don't provoke them, but we nurture and admonish them in a spirit of weakness. And I'll leave it there.